Okay, let's take a look at the hydraulic machine that I use. The first thing to realize is that no foundry uses a standard sort of machine. Every foundry, in fact, develops their own machines over the years. There is no standard. Now, this machine I managed to acquire from a foundry where I worked. It was surplus to their requirements. The machine has four hydraulic cylinders, one at either end so it can open a die left and right, and one down the bottom that uh, will pull a core downwards, and one up the top which can also pull a core upwards, or it can in fact open a die upwards, as is the case with the die that's in the machine at the moment. Let's have a quick look at the simple die that's installed in the machine now. You can see here that it opens vertically and this top bit that I'm pointing at now just goes vertically up and there is a core in the bottom one there that goes vertically down to produce a hole in the casting. Whilst this is a vertically opening die, most dies would probably open in the horizontal manner. When I got this machine, it was being operated by compressed air. Now, air is much too springy. You're much better off having the steady, slow pull of a hydraulic system. So I converted this machine to run on hydraulic pressure. I had to make these control valves because you cannot get control valves that will pass enough fluid to run cylinders this big at this low sort of pressure. They're made from cast bronze and have a half inch to 5.8 diameter port size. They are of a simple four-way tap design. The hydraulics run at about 50 psi and they use a non-flammable hydraulic fluid so that if I do get a pipe burst I'm not going to wind up with a hideous fire that I suddenly have to struggle to put out. Now let's have a look at some of the jobs I actually did in this hydraulic machine. This was a job of course, the coffee percolator uh, heating element which has a, in this case a 1600 watt element cast into an aluminium casting uh, and it only heats quite a small amount of water at once so it heats up very very quickly. There is a full video on making those um, and you can uh, uh, see that at a link I'll, I'll put in down below. This one's a dud, we didn't quite get the element in right, uh, <laughs> a bit too close to the wall. Can't win them all. Let's have a quick look at this part being made. The die concerned has three moving parts. The bit on the right here ha is moved hydraulically whereas the bit on the left is simply manual. The third moving part is the core piece right in the middle of the bottom plate. First thing that happens is that a, an electric il element, which has been heated to about 600 C in a separate little furnace, is tapped into the uh, position into the die. When that's done, uh, a small sand core is placed on top of the uh, metal core, which is actually in the down position at this stage. The right hand side of the die is now moved into its uh, correct position for casting and when it gets there the lower core is raised uh, and uh, check made visually to see whether the core and the element are in the right place. Then the manual half of the die on the left is closed and now we're ready to cast. A ladle full of nice hot metal, this job requires about 760 degrees C is very quickly poured uh, into the casting. We now just have to wait until the casting goes solid. With a spike in place to stop the casting travelling with the right hand side of the die when it's open, the core is first pulled down, then the right hand side of the die is withdrawn hydraulically, the left hand side of the die is pulled away manually, the spike is removed and the casting is now removed from the die. And here is the result of a day's casting. There's 130 castings here, and I regard this job as rather a slow one. This next job is another of those gifts from the Greeks that I got stuck with because they couldn't make the thing themselves. <laughs> and it has a core piece that sits in down the bottom there, and it produces a hanging theatre light clamp. Uh, it's hung by a bolt from up here in the eventual casting. Uh, I don't have a casting I'm afraid but I, I think I got a photograph that shows a bit of one and I'll put that in here now as a still if I can find it. 
Here is a still photograph of the part as it came out from the die. I had to do a bit of work on this die. Uh, again, the people who um, bought it to me didn't really know what they're doing and they've used the smallest piece of material possible to hold the cavity and it's too thin across here. Um, they want to use it all up to about here so there's virtually no feed metal to make certain that the top's solid where they cut a thread. Really, they, they didn't think it through at all. But anyway, I did in the end, after we changed it around a bit, make a, a, a usable casting for them, which was the, the main thing, I guess. But there's this little beast. It's a uh, electrical switchgear cover. An absolute pig of a casting to make. It's thicker here in the middle than it is around the edge. So the feed metal couldn't really get through to here until we uh, padded the casting there. And then if you got the conditions of the die dead right, the metal temperature dead right, and you were wearing odd socks and it was a full moon uh, and you held your tongue right, you could actually make some reasonable castings. That, uh, Yes, it was not my favourite job and I did them under contract for another foundry. I think I know why they gave it to me to do. This was a uh, one we tried, just a little square plate with four lugs. Uh, it proved to be a bit difficult too. The die had four air cylinders that removed the pieces from here. And the core was with withdrawn back this way. Um, and the idea was to produce a reasonably nice finish on here and it sat uh, hold, to hold um, sheets of sat diagonally like that to hold sheets of insulation on sound insulation on walls in soundproof installations. It didn't work well. It was badly designed. The lugs are the same thickness as uh, there so it's very difficult to get uh, uh, cast without a a bit of a shrinkage dimple here and here on each casting and all the gating and feeders was designed to try and get around that but it was very difficult and we we never made very many of those fortunately perhaps though one of our our greatest successes with this machine were these things and they are gas mixers for petrol engines That one's for a forklift because in Australia you can't use a petrol engine forklift inside but you can use a gas engine one. So the petrol ones are imported and then they get converted to gas out here and we make this mixer body and I've made a great great number of those over the years. There is a video on that uh, and there'll be a link in the description to that as well. made a lot of other mixer bodies too. Um, this one we cast with that flange, that oval flange, um, and there you can see the outside of the bodies as cast, and I basically cast it as a, a hollow in here. So the man who had to machine it, um, he didn't have to bore it out of solid bar stock, and he couldn't have cut the oval flange anyway. There's another one. We did So that, believe it or not, is a casting. It mightn't look like it, but it certainly is. 
and you can see by looking inside here you can see the the as cast surface from the die uh, and even these we cast as a little top hat casting and the idea here was to produce something as close to the eventual shape as possible without the necessity for the machinist to have to take out this great big hole in the middle which is quite time consuming sort of business on a lathe uh, particularly if it's a small lathe as it sort of was we also did this flange and what we did with all of this we came up with a modular approach and here it is here oh, heavy of course they always are we had this set up permanently mounted in the die machine also we had this top permanently mounted in the machine and all we ever did was to take uh, a, a die insert we have one here if I can this is the one that makes the flange so this simply fits in there and it bolts into here by these three bolts so this is permanently in the machine this is permanently in the machine and to make the casting we just put bolt this one into the top piece and away we go Let's have a look at this uh, flange die actually running. The metal's just being ladled in here. Um, the excess is about to be pushed away from the top. As the die opens upwards, we have to get rid of that or it'll uh, snag. Uh, now we just wait about 20 seconds and then pull the two little side cores here, the two little cores here, that form the uh, bolt holes in the flange. They're left sitting on the top of the die where they'll stay um, warm enough. The die is then opened. And then it's simply picked up carefully with a pair of tongs and wangled out because it's, it's a bit tight in there. Here we go. And that's one more casting done. The die's closed again. Hydraulics on this machine are actually quite slow, but that's a bit of an advantage sometimes. The two little cores are, are positioned again. And the next casting is then. Here's the day's production. There's about 90 95 parts there. But we made a range of these insides. Here's another one, for example. It makes uh, this small mixer. Now we cast that pretty much to that shape with that flange, uh, and all I had to do was clean it up with less than a millimetre of uh, uh, sort of machining allowance. That sits in there. May not go in now. Yes, there it goes because it's a bit rusty. Um, and then we used this top on it. That's that there, and that was bolted into that. Now, we could change these inserts, of course, quite quickly without a major pull down of the machine. We had to change the cores too, of course, that came up through the bottom, and there's a couple of different ones for different things. And we had, I suppose, oh, I don't know, eight or nine or so sets of these uh, and these so that we could make a wide range of parts and we did and there's a but it's that worked very well and in the great craze we had in melbourne for converting cars from petrol to gas uh we did quite well and made uh, oh tens of thousands i think of these cars at various of these castings to fit most of the uh, the common carburetor petrol cars around at that time Here's a job from years ago, a gravity die job from years ago. I've never done it here, but it was done at a um, gravity die shop where I was a foreman for some years. It's a heat sink for a, a two-way radio that the police used to use, I believe. An absolute pig of a casting. If anybody ever asks you to cast anything with fins, 
run and run fast. Very, very difficult to do. It's difficult. The fins, you see here, they haven't run properly. They're just, the metal has not filled the fin properly. Uh, and the other problem is you usually have to get it so hot to fill the fin that down in the base of the fins here things get too hot and there will be a lot of porosity. When I started at this place we made 70 of these a day. They weren't much good but they were the best we could do so they, they took them on a price concession. By the time I'd finished working with the dye and getting it, uh, it and the operator doing it to uh, do things properly, um, we wound up at 210 faultless castings a day. But it gives you some idea as to what you can sort of do in a day if you get it right. Those, for example, we'll get uh, uh, maybe 220 of those in a day. Um, those are a bit slower. We get about 110, 120 a day. This little nut, I have had as many as 420 odd in a day. Now, let's have another look at a bit of a variant of the processor. Move this out of the way. This isn't strictly gravity dye, but it's pretty damn close. It's casting into rubber moulds, in fact. There's a rubber mould and it's put in a machine that spins it around that axis. So that when you ladle the metal in, it winds up producing that casting. That's the part, and somewhere here, there's the one that we actually used to cast the rubber around to make the die, to make the mould. And I use a steel pin just with some flats on it to let air out as a core to make the hole in the middle and these they work rather well I mean the finish on that's very 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 good and this is uh, a Dow Corning uh, rubber uh, that's in a zinc alloy that's cast at around 500 um, it's a Dow Corning th rubber 30 3120 or 3220 I'm not sure it really in theory can't push it quite as hot as we did here <laughs> um, but it seemed to take it and we made I don't know we might have made 50 of these that's about all the bloke needed um, but it's not a bad way of making a nice simple little part here's another one we did this was a um, a lever that's uh, somewhere in a Range Rover petrol cap, I believe. First of all, I did it in this, which is a, another brand of rubber, and it very quickly began to revert. The heat has destroyed the rubber, and it's all it just goes all gooey and grotty, so I had to scrap that one. Then I got some uh, mouldable silicon rubbers uh, and produce this part in it, produce the same part in it. Now the moldable rubber will take the heat a lot better and, and it works quite well. The only problem with the moldable rubbers is they have a lot of shrinkage whereas the castable ones don't. And finally on that there's this part which was quite quite complicated. Something out of a uh, special computer printer um, and they couldn't get them anymore so um, they asked me if I could make some and in fact we did had to use a little little core piece like that to to do the inside there uh, and they worked quite well we, we spun maybe 30 or 40 of them uh, and that satisfied what they needed and um, they were very happy with that because otherwise they're gonna have to throw the printers out so now it's not strictly gravity die casting it's actually spin casting into rubber molds but it's sort of related and if you're into the production of small parts in large quantities um all sorts of things they do badges whatever a lot of pewter is spun into rubber like this but this material here this is the 12 and there are other zinc alloys that are possibly even a bit better because you can cast them at a slightly lower temperature it's an engineering material you can you can make things with it that need strength um, and as I say that's a very nice neat little part it really is it's quite nice 
And finally, of course, we should not forget the part, the gravity die cast part, whose video prompted uh, all the comments that have led me to make this video about gravity die casting in general. And that, of course, is the four barrel throttle body. Here's a machined one and an as cast one. Now, I'll leave you now with some shots, just a quick series of shots of this actually being poured. And I hope I've inspired some of you to think about giving gravity die casting a go. It's a very useful process and anytime anyone comes to me with more than about 50 parts, particularly if it's a nice simple job and an easy die to cut, I will give very serious consideration to whether or not I can cut a die. You get a more accurate part, you get a more consistent part. You can cut machining allowances down uh, very, very considerably. Um, you get a mechanically stronger part, greater ductility, the grain size is finer, less chance of gas porosity occurring because the casting goes solid that quick, the gas doesn't have time to come out of solution. Um, and you get a better machine finish, uh, in part because the material is stronger and a bit harder, so it machines better, and in part because the grain size is smaller. All in all, it's a process worth devoting a bit of thought to. The four cores are pushed back up. A ceramic filter is placed on the step in between the four cores there and a shell core sort of funnel is placed over the top of that. The left and right and the sides of the die are closed and the uh, small little core is hopefully closed. There it is, more or less. Now the top of the die is uh, brought down to close the whole die up and a little clamp now is just positioned to hold that uh, shell core. And the next casting cord. All through the shell core so it all goes through the funnel. Pause. Final is removed. And the feet are topped up. And that's another one on the way. Right now it's we think about solid enough. Other cores are pulling down. Now the top of the die is lifted upwards to reveal a completed casting and the two side pieces of the die are withdrawn. Now the casting is just sitting there in the base plate, quite free. And with our extra special pair of toms, we That's 18 we've made so far. Here endeth part three and the whole series. I hope that you have enjoyed it and that you have found it useful. Thank you very much for watching.